about every month or so, I buzz in at the back door of our local jail. I click that little buzzer, I wait for the intercom, I introduce myself, the door clicks, I walk through the sterile hallway, uh, I fish up to the left, I wait for the doors to open, no buttons necessary, I look at the cameras that are looking back at me. Uh, I step inside the elevator, it takes me to the proper floor, the doors open into a, a concrete cold room, the officer takes me right or left, either to that row of stools in front of the row of glass where I fidget in my uncomfortable seat and wait, or to the two bucket plastic seats with the table in between and the big red button behind my head that I can push if things happen to go south with an inmate. And I sit there with my little blue Bible and I wait for the officer to come, the jangle of the keys, my friend dressed in all orange, slippers on his or her feet. But I already know what we're going to talk about. Uh, I've been a pastor for 14 years. I've sat in situations like that dozens if not hundreds of times and I can almost guarantee that the topic of conversation for the day will be self-control. Um, I'm going to talk to my friend and we're probably going to talk about self-control. Now, why, why is he back here? What, how did she end up back in jail? Well, the, the normal story is that he got drawn back, she got tempted back to the old ways, the the drinking, the drugs, the, the drama, and now here they are. And so we're going to talk about the story and they're going to tell me what they've been learning, how they've been praying, what they're hoping for, that next time it's going to be different than the last time. Next time, they're not going to go back. Next time, they're going to say no. Next time, they're going to control themselves. And so I open my Bible, I, I read, we pray together, I say goodbye down the elevator, out the back door, into the fresh air, and it strikes me as I take a deep breath outside how much of life hinges on this single thing called self-control. My friends will go back to a thin mattress and I'll go back to a queen-size bed. My friends will stare at a cellmate that perhaps they just met where I will go and kiss my wife and children on the foreheads before the sun comes up. I'll go back to a frozen pizza, to a drive through to good food. They'll be served something that is totally out of their control. I will do what I want and make the schedule I want and their schedule will be dictated and structured and demanded. And it just makes me think how much hinges on this thing that we call self-control. My life or their life? A hard life or a relatively easy life? It just comes back to this. And when you stop and think about it, it's, it's not just a message for our friends who are watching right now from a cell. Isn't it true that so much of the quality of your life, your financial life, your physical life, your relational life, even your spiritual life comes down to that thing we call self-control? Uh, not to freak you out in church, but any of you, any of us, could completely train wreck our life in less than an hour. Right? It, it would take one choice that could ruin a family, that could mess up a marriage, that could land us in prison, that could get us addicted. When it comes to living in this world, you don't always get three strikes or, or five chances. Sometimes it just takes one decision where everything takes a hard turn and changes. And so the topic I want to talk to you about today, when you, when you slow down and think about it, is of infinite importance do you have and do I have, do we have self-control? You know, some of you here today are a lot like my friends who are sitting in a cell. The things that draw your heart are, are very, very explosive and dangerous. I'm going to call them bad boy kind of sins. You know, drinking, to, to be honest, you, you like it, you've done it, you've done it often and you're very tempted by it. Using, partying, escaping, spending money you don't have, clicking on websites that you shouldn't, flirting with people that you shouldn't. These things are very, very interesting to you. And so the anger, the, the abuse, the, the addiction kind of things, like that's where you need self-control before things blow up 
really big. And others of you have never been tempted by getting high or getting wasted or clicking on inappropriate websites. For, for you, the self-control is what, what I'll call the, the good girl kind of sins. Did you know you can blow up your life with fairly socially acceptable behavior? Like, if you're a Christian, but you're super controlling, like you, you just need to be right in every argument in a relationship, or you need things to go your way at work, or you just melt apart and panic and get all tense, like, that can mess you up. If you're highly organized, but you're highly like overwhelmed and overcommitted and exhausting to the people around you, that can mess up your life. If the Bible says that we should rejoice, but you ain't got time for that, and we should live at peace because God is the King of kings and Lord of lords, but you're too busy being productive for that, if you would be patient and kind and loving with people, but, but you don't got time to slow down because there's so many things on your to-do list, like if, if you don't control that part of you that needs to be amazing and excellent and exceptional and have control of everything like that, that can mess up a life today too. And so today's an important topic and it's an essentially serious topic that there is something within me and within you that is so temptable and there's something in the world that we are about to walk back into that is so tempting. And if you and I allow those two to tango, like lives quickly implode. But, <laughs> but if with the help of God we can say no to that, like, yeah, that's interesting, but I'm not interested, not today. If we can resist temptation and we can live a self-controlled life, there are so many good things that come out of it. Like amazing families come out of self-control. Happy Christians come out of self-control. Beautiful churches come out of self-control. Where you're not cleaning up the wreckage of the latest moral accident, you're, you're flying down the highway enjoying the grace of God. That is the blessing of self-control. And that's why today I want to pursue self-control with all my heart with you. There's this amazing Bible passage in Proverbs 25 uh, where God says this. He says, Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. If you think back to ancient times, like everything hinged on how strong the walls of your city were. Walls broken down, an enemy comes riding in, they steal, they kill, they assault, they do the unthinkable. But if you had strong walls, the, the enemy could rattle their swords and shields, they, they could run their horses outside the city walls, but you'd be okay. You'd feast with your friends, you'd lay down and, and sleep at peace. The enemies could bark and not bite and this passage says, that's the blessing of self-control. So, uh, I'm not sure of your struggle uh, I don't know your pet sins or your vices. We all, we all got something. But today, I want to open a Bible and ask, how does God help us control ourselves? Whether it's anger or anxiety, whether it's pornography or impatience, what does God do to slowly and steadily produce in us the fruit of more self-control? Now, uh, to be candid, there's a, a ton of answers to that question. There's rewards that God promises, there's threats that you find in the Bible, there's the blessing of community. But uh, today I actually want to zero in to the two things that I have seen personally in my life produce the most self-control. So we're going to open our Bibles, we're going to cover two big ideas as we pursue the fruit of self-control together. So, grab a pen if you're taking notes, if you're watching at home, do the same. Because here's the, the first and I think one of the best ways to control yourself. It's what I'm going to call guardrails. Guardrails. God produces self-control through guardrails. Now, I'm borrowing that phrase from uh, a pastor who gave a sermon, uh, actually a whole sermon series called Guardrails years ago. And, and here was his point. He said, on the highway, when there's ever like a really dangerous cliff, your car could 
just drive right off of it. If driving over that would like kill you, maim you, ruin everything in a minute, what the government often does is not allow you to drive right here, close to the edge. Instead, way over here, they set up a guardrail. It's like this thing that you hit, and it's a little bit painful, but it prevents you from doing something that's much, much more painful. That's a guardrail. Uh, and this pastor had a brilliant analogy. He said, really smart Christians, really wise people, when they know like the thing that will totally ruin their life, they don't try to walk as close to the edge as they can. Instead, what they do is they make a personal rule that keeps them right here. It's like, here wouldn't be sinful, and here wouldn't be technically wrong, and here there, there's no command from God that says, you shall not. But if I know that I'm very tempted and very easily persuaded to do this, then maybe the one, is, one of the smartest things I can do is to do that. I think about the Apostle Paul wrote to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. It's a city filled with sexual immorality, prostitution, Greek culture. Here's what Paul told the Corinthian Christians. He said in chapter 6, flee from sexual immorality. That's good advice, isn't it? He could have said, just resist it. He could have said, hey, you really shouldn't. He said, no, flee. Like, you guys just became Christians. You got a lot of experience walking past the brothel, the temple. You know that once you see her, you know that once she gives you her, her business plan and pitch, you know once she smiles subtly and wink, you're done for. So what should you Corinthians do? Paul said, flee, run away, take a step back, take the long way around town. Whatever you have to do to stay as far away from temptation, Paul said, do it. And if you're wise and I'm wise, one of the wisest things we can figure out today is figuring out what's the cliff for us and what would it look like to stand far from it? Let me describe it this way. I have here in front of me um, two little magnets. Let's imagine that this is the sin that could really mess up your life. Like, if you go back to this, you're going to end up an addict. You're going to lose her trust. You're going to lose your job. You're going to disconnect from, from Jesus, from God. And let's imagine that this magnet is you. Now, what would the smart thing be if you knew that these two magnets coming together would really jack up your life? Would it be to say, not technically wrong. Officially, I can do this. There's no Bible passage against it. I'm not touching this. Boom. Right? It's like there's something powerful and you say, how, how did that happen? How did I, I didn't plan on doing that. I hate it. I, I prayed last Sunday that I wasn't going to do that. And, and God said, listen, know thyself. Maybe for some people, that's not the temptation. Maybe they can do this. Maybe they can go there. Maybe they can hang out with those people. But if you've seen in your own life that there is a pattern of behavior where wherever you get this close, that happens, then the smart thing you could do today is not get that close. So here's my tough question for you today. What would that look like for you? Like, if you thought really deeply about like the sin that just instantly comes to mind when you have that moment in church to, you know, just talk between you and God. If like, you know what that sin is, what would it look like to make a personal rule to flee from that temptation? For some of you, maybe what you're thinking right now is the struggles you have with social media. You know, Instagram isn't officially wrong. I like Facebook and YouTube. Some of you love TikTok. There, there's no sin or no sin. Thou shalt not in the Bible. But maybe have you noticed a pattern that you don't just look 
when you're on those platforms, but you lust? Or maybe you don't just post, but you kind of boast? Maybe you don't just check and scroll, instead you compare? Maybe after all the scrolling is done, you don't feel more, more patient, more kind, more peaceful, more loving, more like Jesus. Maybe just the insides of you are, are angry, frustrated, impatient, mad at him, frustrated with you. If, if that's hitting home right now, here's a super crazy idea. Don't. Some of you who are a little bit younger, maybe you're not aware of this. You don't have to. (laughs) You will not die (laughs) if you don't check Instagram today. Did you know that? How many of you here today don't have Instagram? Hope by chance? Look around for a second. These look like fairly happy people, don't they? (laughs) <laughs> like we think I would die. I'm, I'm going to lose. I'm not going to have any friends or family. Life's going to be terrible. No, like, like you can make it. And maybe for you, that's what you need to flee from. Not because it itself is wrong, just because it's not right for you. At least not right now. Or how about the news? Uh, right for some of you, your daily news kind of people. It's on your phone, it's on the TV, it's on the tablet. You check it in the morning, you check it at night. Some of you leave it. It's like your white noise in the background while you cook. But have you noticed for some of you that the news doesn't, it doesn't make you more biblical? Right? The Bible would say that there is a God, he's running the show, he is love, he's the king of kings, he is the Lord of lords, all things work out for his good, everything is underneath his feet. These kind of promises let us breathe. Whew. They gave us peace. It's going to be okay. My father's running the universe. But maybe for some of you, after the news, you forget all of that. You just get sucked into this little myopic bit that you can't control and it, it drives you crazy. If that's you, here's a crazy idea. Say it with me. <laughs> don't. <laughs> don't. 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 How many of you have not uh, checked the news today? Look around for a second. Look, at these people look fairly happy, don't they? They're making it, right? <laughs> They're making it. And, and actually, you can too. I've, I've noticed this with my wife, actually. I, I check the news probably six times a day. And my wife does not. She used to. She's kind of stepped away from most of that. And, and sometimes I'll be really like riled up about something. And I try to tell her about it. And then I just realize, why am I doing this? Like, I'm not fixing anything with that. I mean, there's something to be said for knowing about problems and you can do something about it, but just exposing myself to a flood of negative media so I can bring it home and infect my loved ones with it? Maybe the answer is don't. Or, uh, since I'm preaching in Wisconsin right now, um, you don't have to raise your hands for this one. Uh, Have any of you had enough alcohol at any time in the past month that you would not have felt confident driving my children to church? I would suggest this. If there are multiple days, at least two days in the past month, where you would say, I wouldn't take that chance, maybe you are the kind of person who should not have alcohol in their home. We sometimes forget that here in the great state of Wisconsin. Like on God's list of things that are very serious to him, 1 Corinthians 6, the book of Romans, it's not just sexual immorality, it's not just witchcraft, it's not just orgies and the occult. Drunkenness. And, and drinking's not wrong. And enjoying bourbon or, or red wine or craft beer is not wrong. But, but if, you've, if you've found yourself in that habit, Maybe, for you, the answer is, yeah, don't. Like, don't walk into another house party or gathering with friends and say, oh man, I didn't want to. You've seen the magnets. You don't have to be a 
CIA level intelligence. Like you know that when you and that get together, it happens. So brothers and sisters, please don't pray here in church. God, lead us not into temptation. And then lead yourself into temptation. Do some soul searching. Think deeply. Look in the mirror and do the work. If this sounds like a lot of effort and pretty intense, I'm just being biblical. Jesus' close friend Peter said this in 2 Peter chapter 1. He wrote, Make every effort to add to your faith goodness and to goodness knowledge and to knowledge self-control. Like God is, is speaking that word of law in great love. He's a father. He doesn't want you, he doesn't want me to live with the consequences. He doesn't want to see another family blown up, another life ruined, another year of freedom lost. And he says, now, before it's too late, before you drive off the cliff, before the sin touches your life, make every effort, you will not regret it. It makes me think of a drug court judge. Uh, about a year ago, I was with a friend who had to go to court. Um, she's battled addiction for a long time. Just messed a lot of things up in life. But here she was. She was begging the judge for another chance. And it turned out that day that the, the judge in the courtroom was actually the head of the county drug court. So this judge had heard, whew, what, dozens, probably hundreds of people who said, I know what I did. I know what I used to do. But I'm making a promise to you today, judge, it's going to be different. Give me a chance. Show mercy on me. Let me walk away free. And so my friend gave her speech and, and the judge responded. And what the judge said was so brilliant. As soon as she said it, I, I knew, like, I'm going to steal this. The, the judge listened with empathy and patience and love. And then she looked at my friend and she said, young lady, what you need are new people, new places, and new things. Right? You want a new life? You're making all these promises to me, but I'll tell you what, if you go back to the same old people you used with, the same old places where you used to get high, the same old habits, your life is going to turn out the same. And I thought, judge, that'll preach. Right? New nouns. And I speak to you in love and earnestness. If you want to make a change in your life, if you want to say no to an old habit or sin, what you need are new people, new places, new things. Make every effort to add to your knowledge of yourself self-control. So where does self-control come from? Point number one, guardrails. All right, deep breath. If you're ready for part number two, give me a thumbs up. All right, here's the second key to self-control. First is guardrails. Second thing I want to share with you today is the gospel. The gospel. Now, the gospel, if you're new to Christian lingo, is just the good news of what Jesus has done for us. Right? The law are the, the things you do or don't do, be self-controlled, make every effort. That's the law, what I just shared with you. The gospel isn't something that you do, it's something that Jesus did for you. He lived, he died, he rose on the third day, he forgives you, he cleanses you, he saves you, he gives you a place in heaven, he makes you good enough for God. According to the Bible itself, the second key, maybe the most powerful key to producing self-control is focusing on the gospel. Uh, it's actually what the Apostle Paul said to his friend Titus. I had a chance this past week to read all of the Bible passages in this whole book that talk about control or self-control. There are about 30 or 40 of them. And what I found kind of interesting is that the, the hot spot for self-control in this entire book was this tiny little letter in the New Testament called Titus. Have you read it before? 
Um, it's pretty interesting. Titus was a pastor on the Greek island of Crete in the Mediterranean Sea. And if you'd read just the first few verses of the book of Titus, you would find out that Cretans, Cretans were not famous for self-control. Right? Crete was like the Vegas of the ancient world. Um, pe- people lied, they swindled, it was Greek culture, so sexual immorality, prostitution, plenty of adultery, drunkenness was a form of worship. Um, there's this one line where they said, uh, Cretans, where is it? Cretans are always liars, evil brutes, lazy gluttons, This saying is true. Uh, But then the message of Jesus comes to the island of Crete. The Apostle Paul is leaving his friend, a pastor named Titus, there. And what what is Titus going to do as he runs point and tries to make this very sinful island less sinful? How will they control themselves? You could say, have a guardrail, run. But when you're on an island... (laughs) It's hard to run away, so what would they do? And as you start to read, Paul's answer is, um, you need to preach about self-control. He says, Titus, the first thing you need to do is find pastors who are not just biblical and theological, but they're self-controlled. If the pastors and leaders of the church are falling off cliffs, things are going to blow up. And then in chapter 2, he says, you need to make sure you tell all the people in the church the importance of self-control. You can read this for yourself later. But he says, uh, teach the older men to be self-controlled. You ever seen any grouchy older guys before? We're slowing down. We're like Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite. We're, you know, living in the past. And like, we're just angry kids these days. And my dad, remember, I walked uphill both ways. Like, no, tell the old guys to take a deep breath, to be self-controlled. And Paul said, tell the women to do the same thing. Women on Crete, much like many women in America today, are a little bit too attracted to wine. And when the bottles start flowing, the words start flowing too, and gossip happens, and slander happens, and being disrespectful of of husbands and fathers happens. So you you need to tell them, Titus, that the women need to be self-controlled with their wine and their words. And then, this is my favorite part, he says in verse 6, similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled Period. <laughs> like that, that's all you have to tell the young guys. Like these buck wild bachelors, tell them, I know you want to, just don't. <laughs> it's like, this is what you need to preach. Self-controlled pastors, self-controlled older men, self-controlled women, self-controlled younger men. And you want to ask the Apostle Paul, well, how? Yeah, everyone, just don't sin, okay? Amen. Paul, How? And I got to tell you, what, what Paul says in this chapter is so, it, it is so fundamental for the way that we do church here at the core and what we preach at Time of Grace. Do you know what he says next after all this be self-controlled, be self-controlled, be self-controlled? Let me read you Titus 2 verses 11 and 12. He says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It This is grace. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present age. Uh, I cannot tell you how important those words are. Like, what will teach me to say no to that sin? What will inspire me to stand back here when all my friends are having fun here, here, and here? Uh, How can you face that same old temptation but have a whole new reaction to it? Paul's answer is grace. When you think about the grace that appeared on earth 2,000 years ago, when you slow down and meditate on the crazy undeserved love that Jesus gave when he gave his life for you. When you stop just thinking about do's and don'ts and start meditating on the done that happened at the cross, like, something happens. 
it's actually lo- logically very difficult to explain, but something happens in your heart where without a, a carrot or a stick, you just want to. Some people call this gospel motivation. What, what motivates me is not the law and its demands. It's not the fact that I might end up in hell or train wreck my life. The greatest thing that drives my heart is the love of God that captured my heart. Other Bible passages say it like this, Christ's love compels us. Or we love because he first loved us. Uh, it's kind of like if you're in an amazing relationship. You know, you're out grabbing a drink with a friend, you've fallen for this guy, you're married to this woman that you love, and someone flirts with you, and your friends say, Woo! And you say, I don't want to. <laughs> like, why would I choose the, the lesser of two sources of joy? I found something better. And I have no doubt there would be short-term pleasure if I crossed that line, but I don't want to. It's like love captures your heart. Why do some of you parents sit on an uncomfortable grade school bleacher on your free Saturday to watch, you know, B-team volleyball? The answer is because of love. Because when something stirs your heart so deeply, you... You want to and you choose to. And there are other options that might be more fun in the moment, but you choose the thing that grabs your heart. And this is the power of being connected to the gospel. We stand in front of the cross of Jesus and we just think of the incredible self-control and grace that won our salvation. Can you picture him there? It's like his body is slumping and he's suffocating slowly. The only way for Jesus to even breathe is to pull up on the the nails which are smashing into the nerves. His his back is ground beef, splinters, blood, spit, bugs. And and that's the easy part because all of God's wrath and anger over sin is poured out on Jesus. And in that moment, Do you know what his enemies are doing at the foot of the cross? They're mocking him. Oh, the Son of God, huh? Well, come on down. He saved others. Let's watch him save himself. Then then we'll worship this king of the Jews. Can I ask, if you were Jesus in that moment, what would you have done? I know my answer. If I'm Jesus, if I have divine power, if I can do miracles, here's what I would have done. I would have turned this Pharisee's face and this Pharisee's backside into two very powerful magnets. (laughs) And I just would have grinned from the cross. Like, whoa, what's that? What were you saying? (laughs) Right, you ever been mocked before when you're in pain? Just everything in you wants to get back at people. Do you know what Jesus did? Nothing. He saved his breath so he could talk to his father. His love for you and for me, for people who struggle insanely with self-control, it was so deep, it was so profound, and it was so perfect. He was like a lamb to the slaughter and he didn't even open his mouth. And because he was so self-controlled, you and I today can say that through faith in him, we're saved. We're good. In the middle of our Romans 7 prayers, God, why do I keep doing this stupid stuff that I hate? Like in our next breath, we can say, but thanks be to God. I'm forgiven. I'm cleansed. I'm loved. I'm good. I deserve nothing. He gave me everything. I deserve the back of his hand. Instead, he gave me his shining face. Jesus is so with me and he is so for me. You think about that self-control and and something happens in here where that sin is tempting but now there's something else inside of you that just doesn't want to. I kind of think of it like um, teaching my daughters to cut the grass. 
I have two kind of teenage-ish daughters. And they're kind of at that age where they can fulfill the purpose for which I had them. <laughs> One of the purposes for, for which I had them. Right? So I'm trying to, trying to teach them how to, how to mow the yard. And if you know anything about cutting grass, there are two primary rules to cutting the grass. Number one, thou shalt cut all of the grass. Number two, thou shalt cut the grass in very straight lines. <laughs> But if you've ever tried to cut the grass, it's actually trickier than you think, huh? Well, you, you grab on really tightly to that mower, you, you stare, you can even walk slowly and you get to the end and you look back and say, what the, how much did I have to drink today? <laughs> it's, like, it's like this wa- wandering line. It's really difficult to cut a straight line, but there's a trick. You know what? The trick is that you just look at something else. You, know, you pick a bush, you pick the edge of the house, you, you pick a tree in the distance. And if you stop looking at yourself and you just stare and don't move your eyes, you turn around and it's the straightest thing in the world. I was reading a Christian book the other day that said, following God is a lot like that. We want to mow straight lines in the kingdom of God. We want to be patient and kind. We want to be self-controlled. We don't want to sin. And sometimes the more you think about your own behavior, the more it ends up like this. So according to Paul, do you know what the key is? You stare at something else. You pick a tree. The tree. And the more you focus on the grace of God that brings salvation to all people, the more one day you just might turn around and say, huh. Not instantly. Faith is organic. But God can change you. Through guardrails, absolutely. But even more through the gospel. And I think that's why I always end up talking about Jesus. As I sit in the jail on that uncomfortable stool with my little blue Bible, I'm trying to find the perfect passage to encourage my friend. And there's plenty of Proverbs about the friends that you pick and the habits that you have. But I normally flip past those and I get to the gospel. And I just tell my friends what the police officers maybe never will, that what they need most is not more self-control. It's more Jesus. Brothers and sisters, yes, make every effort. But even more, fix your eyes on the grace of God, the grace that saves us and then teaches us to be self-controlled. Let's pray. Uh, Dear God, thank you so much for, for working in our hearts today. Um, for all of us, God, life could be a thousand times worse if you hadn't answered that prayer to lead us not into temptation. We thank you, as imperfect as it was, for the self-control of our past. And I pray now, God, for a a mighty move of your Spirit to produce just an abundant harvest of self-control in our hearts. Um, God, you could really change the trajectory of lives of people who are sitting in a cell right now. You've done it before and you can do it again. We, we pray this prayer for them. We pray for all of us who are here today live, God, that you would help our, our families and our faith, our connection to you. The devil is a liar, uh, but unfortunately, he's a good one. So help us to believe that the best blessings don't come from flirting with sin or seeing how close to the line we can get, but instead making every effort to honor you with our bodies, our words, our lives, and our everything. God, change our habits today. Give us courage to make bold choices today. But more than anything, God, help us not to just think of ourselves and our steps, but to lift up our eyes and think of your Son. He is the source of our salvation. He he is the reason that this struggle with self-control is temporary. He's the sole source of all forgiveness and love. So we thank you, God, for the gift of Jesus, for your grace that brings salvation to all people. We pray that you'd bless us today. Personally, as a congregation, and as your big Christian family. We ask this all in the holy, sacred, beautiful name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen.